Hello and welcome to another episode of the Iraqi Nutrition Podcast. I'm your host Juma Iraqi and today's topic we're going to talk about uh, nutrition for combat sports and with me today I have Danny Lennon. Danny, how are you doing today? I'm doing great Juma, thanks so much for having me on the podcast. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this podcast. So uh, before we start with today's topic I just want to inform that you could fi- you can find this podcast in video format on YouTube, but you can also listen to it on iTunes if you want. So, uh, Danny, for people that uh, might not know you, could you please give us a short introduction about yourself? Yeah, sure. So, I I suppose the the short version is I have a master's degree in nutritional sciences from uh, University College Cork, where I studied under Professor Kevin Cashman. And previous to that, I have an undergraduate degree in biology and physics education. And... uh, following my master's degree, ended up founding Sigma Nutrition and Performance, which is a a company that essentially tries to put out evidence-based information around nutrition uh, and then related topics towards performance. And we also have a coaching service within the the company as well. Um, And so been running that for the last couple of years. And uh, my personal work with coaching clients tends to be with combat sports athletes, so professional boxers, pro MMA fighters, um, and then other athletes trying to make weight. So for example, Olympic weightlifters or powerlifters. And um, yeah, that's the kind of short Cliff Notes version. Excellent. And for people that uh, haven't listened to Danny's uh, podcast, Sigma Nutrition Radio, I, I highly recommend it. It's uh, by far one of my favorite uh, podcasts and he always um, have great questions and bring a lot of great guests. So great job on your podcast, Danny. Oh, thanks very much. It means a lot. Yep. Thanks, Juma. And you also hit 1 million downloads yesterday. Yeah, this week has been a, a big milestone week. We hit 1 million downloads. So um been something we've been kind of closing in on for a while. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a nice milestone to hit. And so hopefully people stay listening to it and we can do plenty more. I'm sure they will. So congrats on that. Thank you. Okay, let's get into the, the questions. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of different uh, protocols that you, people use when we're uh, looking at athletes, fighters in, in combat sports. And mm. some are probably not as optimal for what the people are trying to achieve. So if we were to start with the question on uh, nutrition fundamentals that fighters should, should focus on, what would your uh, advice be to that? Yeah, so when it comes to any sort of performance nutrition, particularly for the fighters, Um, It's quite an interesting group because there tends to be, I think, different phases where their nutrition demands will change slightly or at least the focus of the nutrition changes slightly. So the way we try and think of it with our athletes is they'll have an initial phase which will be outside of an immediate fight coming up. So maybe they don't have a fight booked yet or they're just training um, in that period after they've previously had a fight. So they have maybe a, a few months where they're just training to get better. And so there we're going to have obviously a big emphasis on performance and we're not really trying to bring down body weight too much um, unless they're an athlete with excess body fat that needs to be lost. Then they'll maybe transition to a separate phase where there's going to be actually a a fight on the horizon in the coming months or maybe like six to eight weeks time. And they need to slowly start bringing down body fat levels just to mean that they're going to have to cut less weight the week of the fight if they're getting down to their kind of leanness state if they do have excess body fat to lose. So that phase is interesting in that they have to try and blend that approach of gradually bringing down body fat levels without really hurting performance, which is where a lot lot of guys uh, go wrong, which is I'll circle back to that. And then the kind of next phase tends to be maybe a week to 10 days out from the weigh-in, there will be a completely separate protocol we'll use for the actual weight cut itself um, in terms of not losing tissue or or body fat, but trying to bring down body weight through manipulating uh, levels of water in the body, uh, glycogen levels within the muscle and liver, et cetera, et cetera, to almost artificially so to speak bring down their weight to weigh in before rehydrating and refueling them so they can compete at a higher weight uh, compared to their weigh-in weight Um, and then there's probably that period after the weigh-in where they'll do a completely separate protocol and then just after a fight to try and stop them from ballooning back up which can often happen for guys between fights so for the fundamentals really we're talking about how do they fuel performance and how do they maintain good body composition so 
I suppose the kind of few key things to, to bear in mind, uh, and I'm sure you've covered a number of these on previous podcasts, when we're looking at any athletes, obviously protein intake is going to be hugely important. And um, particularly with uh, fighters, because of not only the amount of training they're doing, but maintaining a lean body composition. And like we said, a lot of them tend to be in phases where they're trying to bring down body weight. That tends to be uh, one of the classic cases where a higher protein intake is probably required. So this could be, depending on the person, maybe two grams per kilo, maybe two and a half grams per kilo if they're actually dieting. So a, a high protein intake and having that distributed throughout the day so that they can uh, get probably like at least I would say four high protein meals throughout a day. But for guys in that are training maybe twice a day, that could be a number could be higher. The, the kind of next fundamental is probably putting in place a high carbohydrate intake, uh, at least on the majority of the days that they're training. Um, typically, the, the guys that I work with uh, would be training twice a day, probably six days a week. And due to just the nature of MMA or boxing being quite a glycolytically demanding sport, having a high amount of carbohydrate to fuel that training is important. Um, and then I suppose an a in, in line with that as well, because they're training twice a day, if those two sessions are going to be tough training sessions, then we have more requirement of the type of carbohydrate we're going to use after that first session to be a uh, fast absorbing carbohydrate or maybe like a, a powdered carbohydrate uh, supplement after that first one to try and get glycogen levels back up. So they're kind of some of the, the fundamentals we're trying to do uh, of fueling performance, then obviously we have things like hydration, uh, electrolyte balance to try and maintain performance. Um, really, any of the the main fundamentals uh, that you presumably discussed before of athletes that, who are in those types of glycolytically demanding sports. Um, and so doing that within the context of, as always, we try and emphasize good quality food. Um, and again, I know that's quite a generic vague term that people don't like, but the majority of the diet just being uh, whole foods and uh, not necessarily everything but at least most of it and then we can kind of look at things like supplementation which is not really uh, that kind of staple fundamental but can be a, a very important aspect for these uh, pro fighters excellent now when when we're talking about this um, transition phase when when people are trying to lose um, lose lose fat before the competition you said mm. like you started like six eight weeks out from from a competition to change things up but yeah no just to jump in on that that, that kind of uh that time frame is more kind of arbitrary it's basically depending on when someone has a fight coming up so in general it just tends to be when fighters get most in contact with me or when they get a fight booked, there tends to be maybe like a, an eight week window mm -hmm. roughly. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think also it works well as just a kind of rough guide because we don't, don't necessarily need to have the fighter at their absolute leanest all year round because there's obviously going to be things where they're going to have to cut back on how much they're taking in if they're trying to maintain a super lean physique, <clears throat> how much fuel they can take in to therefore power their performance. And also maybe just training more of the time over the course of the year with a, a bit more body fat isn't really going to hamper them too much yeah. and may actually provide some kind of protection and, and maybe uh, a bit useful. So typically if they, we will kind of have a window of how far we're going to let their, their weight drift upwards. But then, yeah, typically it tends to be six to eight weeks. We'll start trying to bring that down. Excellent. Now I, I personally work with uh, judo, judo athletes. And one thing that's a bit tricky about judo is that they frequently have competitions, so you usually yes. you have like every every six seven weeks you have a competition. So you're n really not getting a phase outside mm. of uh, the dieting sometimes, and it's not really that optimal to just let the body fat get get too high because it just right. gets uh, difficult compared to, for example, a a boxer, uh, mm. a championship boxer who, who would maybe fight. Some of them just fight once a year, maybe. It would be mm. easier. But uh, obviously, when you're working with a lot of these uh, combat sport athletes, you uh, encounter a lot of different uh, strategies that they use for bringing their uh, body weight and fat down. But what are more optimal ways to use it without it uh, affecting performance? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a really good point, and I'm, I'm sure as you've seen with with guys that came to you, 
previous methods they may have used is they end up dropping calories really, really low, um, at least to a point where it's too much and that it hampers performance recovery too much and the calories end up being a lot lower than they, they need to be. Usually this isn't even by consciously trying to hit a certain level of calories. It's more about the type of rules or uh, guidelines they put in their own head of, okay, I need to start making weight. So I'm going to take out all these types of foods from my diet and my diet is basically going to be this. So it typically tends to be them taking out quite a lot of carbohydrates from the diet. They'll say that, okay, I'm not going to have any more bread or potatoes or rice and um, because I know people who have done that and have found that they, their body weight starts dropping immediately. Uh, and we obviously know a lot of that tends to be from water and glycogen losses initially. And then they end up focusing on things like maybe some chicken and turkey or some white fish with some maybe some green vegetables as a lot of their main meals. So yes, that will help to get body weight down because they're consuming very little calories. Uh, they're very consuming quite low amounts of carbohydrates relative to what their actual demands of their training is. And so it's a really, like you said, a suboptimal strategy, right? The two main things that are going to power their performance during that training camp is going to be calories and carbohydrates. And so the way we have to try start doing it as a more strategic manner is how do we get them to be in a very slight deficit that gradually body weight is going to be coming down or, or body fat levels are going to be coming down, but there's still enough there to allow them to train hard and to recover from those sessions. And then on top of getting the amounts of calories and carbohydrates right and making sure that deficit isn't too large, we can then start looking at things like, say, nutrient timing and supplementation, which, uh, as we've discussed kind of off air, maybe for the general population isn't so much a big deal, but for competitive athletes can be a huge factor, right, of what, when exactly do we partition these carbohydrates over the course of the day? Could having a meal at this many hours before a priority training session with a large percentage of their daily carbohydrates in it actually impact and, and help that performance despite them being in a deficit over the course of the 24-hour period? Um, and similarly, we, can we use um, – whether that's um, a small amount of carbohydrate powder or some caffeine, can we use these small bits of supplementation to actually improve performance or at least decrease the RPE during that training session uh, for these athletes? So those things start to become more important. And so to get a more optimal strategy, we're going to try and diet very gradually and get body fat down level uh, at, a, at a very slower rate so that we're just keeping more carb uh, calories in the diet to empower performance. Uh, now, obviously, we should mention the caveat here is that presumably this is if we have an ideal timeline. Uh, generally, when we're working with a, a, an athlete in the longer term and we can periodize what their nutrition is going to look like over many months, this is easier to do. If you get an athlete come to you, which is often the case, and they've like three weeks before a fight and they let themselves get out of shape, then of course, you need to take more dramatic steps and you're going to have to accept that trade off that for the athlete, there is going to be a decrease in their training performance. But at that point, time point you just have to diet them harder because otherwise they're going to miss weight so that's the kind of caveat there but in an ideal world that's where we do it gr very gradually bring down body fat levels whilst looking at things like the overall amount of calories and carbohydrates we put in the diet uh, protein obviously as well as important and then the timing and then say supplementation around that as well can help mitigate a lot of the issues that tends to crop up with hypocaloric dieting excellent uh, a great point on the thing that you mentioned on the uh, nutrient uh, nutrient timing as well. That when when carbohydrate uh, amounts are are limited, it's it might be uh, th that's where nutrient timing might play a big role. Where you start to center a lot of the carbohydrates around around the workout uh, sessions. Yeah, for sure, uh, and, and this is when we try and tie it in with the the training schedule that the athlete has. So this is where it's important to communicate with their coaches that they're working with and the athlete themselves. And if we have an idea over the week when the different training sessions are going on, what is the actual nature of that session? What is the Which ones are the priority ones? Which is, say, a hard sparring session versus a light recovery session? Now we can even get more detailed about where we partition those limited amounts of calories and carbohydrates. And um, so, for example, like we have X amount of carbs on a given day. If we know after that second training session, the athlete's next section the following morning is just a real easy recovery session, then we don't need to slam loads of carbs after that workout to try and get glycogen levels back up. 
So we can keep more of those daily carbohydrates for before that earlier in the day, which may actually help those more priority training sessions. So I think uh, that's a really good point you bring up because it's actually one thing that often people forget is how you really have to work within a, a, a group and tie into what the other coaches are doing because these athletes have a number of different coaches in different areas and really it needs to be a kind of approach that's centered around the athlete that everyone's involved with and which I'm, I'm sure you've seen with with the the judo guys as well of having that communication with their coaches and being able to fi- basically set things up of to suit them as opposed to them having to work around their nutrition yeah one thing that we've actually been working on a lot with is periodizing the carbohydrates during the week so on days where there's low intensity we don't shuffle as much carbohydrates into our systems mm. but we uh, instead uh, prioritize it on the di- days where we have higher intensity and mm. that's actually been going quite well in regards to people um, maintaining a better uh, more stable weights and not gaining as mm. much uh, do outside of outside of uh, competition so usually we have like different phases we go into if it's like like uh, similar to what you do if it's far away from from the competition we have much higher uh, calories in, in general mm. and then we transit uh, we transition the athletes from one phase to the other based on how they are progressing excellent yeah i really like that uh, of, of um james morton has spoke before to me mm. about looking at some of the, the the boxers that he's worked with and similarly periodizing carbohydrates okay. um, and doing some of that low glycogen availability training maybe on, on, on a weekend day where they're just going for a light jog or a run where it's not really as important to performance wise it's more for the adaptations they'll get and, and using that low glycogen training and recovery so th- that's really interesting to, to see using it with, with those guys for yeah. sure Another thing is, uh, and this is probably something that you've encountered yourself with with uh, combat sport athlete, is when when you have athletes that have too low of uh, body fat in the first place, and they're trying to compete in a lower uh, body weight class. What mm. what do you usually advise those kind of? Because obviously you have to. Uh, at some point, you have to start sacrificing muscle mass to get uh, in in the lower uh, body weight classes. Right, for sure. So, yeah, one of the first things we look at is is their previous fights, uh, where they've competed previously, what type of weight cut do they have to go through, what did that look like, and then obviously their current body composition. So we try and fix upper limits of how much weight they can actually drop the week before they're away in. So in that final seven days, how much are they going to likely be able to drop via water and, and carbohydrate manipulation, uh, electrolyte manipulation, etc.? How much can they drop in that seven-day window? And we try, or the, uh, and we try and fix it at a point of okay, as an upper limit, we generally try and aim for about eight percent of their their body weight as a kind of upper limit, provided that they have twenty-four hours plus between the weigh-in and the fight. Now, if we're talking about someone who can who weighs in and competes on the same day, this is completely different that they can cut very small amounts of weight because the rehydration window is so small. But for a 24-hour plus weigh-in, we try and fix, okay, a week before the weigh-in, you can probably be 8%, maybe as far as 10% at an absolute push above that, that the point you're going to cut, uh, have to weigh in at and we can probably get that weight down for the weigh in and have you successfully rehydrated in time for the fight uh, and for you to be performing well so if someone is so lean right now that they can't really diet any uh, any further or it's they're going to have to like you say lose lots of muscle mass to get down to that say eight to ten percent limit uh, of the body weight over what they're going to compete at then they have obviously have a decision to make and generally that's a point where they may consider going up a weight class um and so one of the kind of things that becomes more difficult is just how um individualized we find the response that people have to given weight cuts some people can go through be the similar weights to one another go through a similar protocol and the actual changes in body weight number one can be slightly different but more so the response and the reaction of the athlete some can be absolutely um crucified by the type of um uh cut they go through where others actually feel fine so there is some degree of individualization there um of how much they can tolerate but generally we like to see eight percent from a week out being that kind of upper point some guys like i say can probably get away with ten percent but this probably generally depends on things like 
say, muscle mass, for example. The more muscle someone has, they'll generally be able to store a bit more glycogen, so they could probably do more of a, a cut within that last kind of seven days. Um, but yeah, to your point, generally, if we think someone's going to have to, isn't, doesn't really have much body fat to lose and is still well above that limit, then they're going to be a candidate where we're going to probably say you may uh, think about going up a weight class, which I think is uh, oftentimes you never really see um, athletes think about or combat sport athletes at least think about uh, going up a weight class to become more competitive they always think of going down yeah. oh if i just go down i'll be more competitive yeah. uh, and and it's really a strange one because there's been some really good examples of people who've gone up weight classes and just been so much better at that and they can perform so much better but yet there's still this kind of mindset within the the culture of combat sports of the way to get more competitive is to get down to a lower weight class if you can and sometimes guys just do stuff that's just hampers their performance too much and it's just not worth it yeah uh, exactly and we're going to get to that uh, point as a final question in this podcast today but before that uh, moving on uh, is there um, is there any supplements in particular that can be beneficial to uh, to fighters to use yeah so i think that the staple ones that we see in a lot of um sports uh, performance nutrition right now are, are probably going to still apply here particularly when we think of the type of activity they're doing so we'll have guys generally most of them will be taking a, a creatine monohydrate supplement um we'll generally have then before morning sessions guys will typically have some sort of caffeine and um, whether that's actually from a supplement form or whether it's from a coffee or, or uh, an energy drink is, is kind of based on their own preference but caffeine could be useful. We'll then obviously use supplemental carbohydrate powders just purely for the reasons we've outlined before of, of restoring glycogen and, and feeling training performance. And then we've also done some stuff with uh, sodium bicarbonate, which I've found to be really, really useful. Um, so uh, you've probably discussed this before as well, but it's going to act as a uh, essentially a, as, a, as a buffer um, and can work up as as far as maybe 25 to 30 grams we have some people take probably 30 to 60 minutes before a session um and we found some really good results with, with guys using sodium bicarbonate um for people who are listening who are maybe thinking about trialing that i would suggest doing that uh working up from a small dose and testing out gradually on your own before going and doing it because um if you take a large dose just before you go training um, and it's your first time you can have some kind of um, bad gastrointestinal distress that will be quite embarrassing. So start with a small dose, build it up, test how you feel. But we found some good effect from that. Um, a, a couple of things that the the fighters we're using at the moment are currently kind of experimenting with. Some of them have looked at some of like um, beet juice shots that are obviously big in, in endurance sports right now. Um, I haven't collected enough kind of um, stuff from from the guys to see what exact performance benefits they're getting and it's not something that we've done a ton of in the past but i can definitely see maybe some of them are going to feel some benefit but um they'd be the principal ones i think once they have a lot of that stuff checked off we're probably in a good space um beta alanine is one that uh, a lot of them will be using as well that is obviously we've got a decent amount of um research behind um but outside of that main handful there isn't too much else that would be a staple across the board uh, the rest of it is kind of some individuals will be having some, some others will be have, have different types of supplements. But they're from a performance perspective, they're the, the main ones that tend to be used. Excellent. And the last one you mentioned, Beta Allen, it seems to actually benefit fighters uh, the most. When you're, when you're looking at the research, there's a lot of data specifically looking at uh, combat sports uh, athletes mm. that seem to get a benefit even i think the first studies that came out when beta alanine started to get popular a couple of years ago were on boxers mm. where they saw um like you uh, much much better force in their punches and the frequency of how many punches they had during a simulated match was increased yeah but dosage was pretty high i think it was six 6.4 grams of beta alanine. yeah mm. so that, that that becomes a challenge especially when uh, as i'm sure you find that trying to get people to take stuff on board um if it's relatively easy and uh okay to do and they, f they feel good from it it's fine but when you have something like 
beta alanine if they're not really bought into the whole process around it and then they start feeling like this tingling sensation and the side effects you typically get from such a high dose then a lot of them will just end up saying oh i'm not going to bother with this and they'll stop taking it but but generally yeah that's that's some of the what we see reported as well from from the guys that do use it regularly is that it's more over a a long session even towards the end they feel they have more power with those, those punches the longer so it just being able to sustain their higher rate of power for longer tends to be the main benefit that they're na- noticing as well so um yeah that 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 can be a really interesting one for sure yeah excellent now uh, to wrap up this podcast with with the last question um let's talk about the last week before a fight because that's where uh, a lot of people do a lot of interesting and uh, often dangerous uh, dangerous mm. things and i know that um, professor claus and james uh, D- uh, dr james morton has focused a lot on this area on the danger of different protocols that a lot of fighters yes. use could you mention a couple of the techniques that some fighters use that can be dangerous yeah so so typically what you see guys doing to try and make weight is often it tends to be extremely low calorie diets because they just try and eat as as little food as they can get away with that week there tends to be severe dehydration which comes around from a number of techniques so this could be from just cutting off uh, water intake or consuming very little amounts of water all the way through to doing excessive amounts of exercise to sweat that out or inducing sweating through things like um, using a sauna or a steam room or getting in a sweatsuit and jumping on a piece of cardio equipment. So severe dehydration techniques via inducing sweat from different means. Uh, You also then have more dangerous techniques like using like pharmaceutical grade laxatives, pharmaceutical grade diuretics um, that that guys have used. Um, You'll also get techniques like uh, excessive spitting so guys will get a bottle and keep spitting into it to just get more fluid out um then you can obviously have more um crazy things like inducing vomiting to try and get anything that is still left in the gastrointestinal uh, tract still up so lots of these techniques are obviously dangerous and we know that uh when you get to any point of severe dehydration it's going to become a a pretty big issue not to mention someone that's then going to go and compete in a fight where they're going to get repeatedly hit in the head only a few uh, like a number of hours or a number of days later so what we try and do with our fighters is to look at okay all these methods that are being used what is the point of them right we're trying to artificially bring down weight a lot of it is to do with dehydration but we can um and which we do as well with our fighters um which i should say but there is a smarter way to do it so the typical way we try and bring down weight is through a few different means. One is obviously bring down water weight via number one. Uh, we'll use some degree of dehydration the, the day before uh, the weigh-in by bringing down water intake. And then the morning of the weigh-in, some of them may actually use some sauna use, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. We'll also uh, have carbohydrates restricted to a low amount over that kind of final seven to maybe nine days before that weigh-in. Um, so maybe something like 30 grams a day. So basically depleting glycogen stores over that time point, which will lose uh, s- some water as well that gets associated with glycogen. Um, we can also cut out um, maybe change uh, sodium intake uh, coming closer to the weigh-in day uh, to lose some more water. Then we'll do things like lose a, a low residue diet, which just means there'll be less residue left in the as- actual intestine and gastrointestinal tract. So it tends to be like three days um, before the the weigh-in, they'll go on a low residue, low fiber diet. Um, So there are principal uh, type of methods. Uh, And with that, then the way we try and focus of it is because there's really two two ideas here, right? There's the extreme stuff where people are using all these kind of dangerous protocols. And the other end, there's going to be the what's most optimal for health and a safety point of view. But then somewhere in between is what we're going to probably get when we're working with professional fighters who are doing this as their profession. The main thing for them is to make weight and to win this. And if you say to them, okay, most optimally is not to cut any weight, right? So just go up to this other weight class. That's not going to be something you can practically do with these guys. They're just going to go somewhere else. So we have to, to some degree, be able to get them to make weight. And so the way we try and do it is, 
for the, the I suppose the big mistake that a lot of them are making, particularly with the dehydration, is doing it too far out from the weigh-in. So they'll start on a, if they're weighing in on a, a Friday, for example, the Monday and Tuesday of that week, some of them start dropping their water intake really low and dehydrating themselves, or walking around all week in a sauna suit and sweating, and so they're they're really in a semi to to fully dehydrated state for almost three to four days leading up to the weigh-in, which is obviously going to have a huge stress on their body. Whereas what we try and do it is the real drop in water weight comes literally the day before the weigh-in, where they'll drop most of that water weight. And like we say, if they have then have a, a couple of pounds left the morning of the weigh-in, they might use a sauna for a very short period of time, get off that last couple of pounds, go and weigh in, and then immediately start the rehydration. So the idea from our end is to try and have them, in when they're actually in a uh, quite severely dehydrated state, for as short a time period as possible, as opposed to being... Uh, dehydrated for many days on end which them t- typically do um so we will use some of these strategies that again get associated with being dangerous but in a way that we uh i don't think are going to be really damaging health or putting them at any real risk uh because number one we have that cap of how much weight we're going to allow them to drop so like i said typically around eight percent of body weight um once we have that cap in place and then being able to allow them to um, be dehydrated for a short period of time and then focusing on a really good quality rehydration strategy as soon as they weigh in that kind of mitigates most of, of, of the risk um, and, and you see this in a lot of the research that has looked at uh, dehydration or, or cutting weight strategies and how that may be a, a affect performance you see any of the stuff that affects performance negatively is when they do this dehydration and then test performance metrics. When you have a recovery window, even some of these studies like are of four to six hours, you can see that they can get performance back up with no real uh, decrease for, uh, and I mean that four to six win- hour window is based on like a, a, a cut of maybe three or four or 5% of body weight. So if we have a longer period of time and we have a bigger um, amount of, of, or we have a bigger weight cut, we should be able to, to take care of that and not really hamper performance. Um, and plus, with these guys, what ties into performance goes into so much more than just um, needing to be, I suppose, in, in, in the perfect state of, of health right at that time point. Um, but yeah, I think, so that, that's the way we generally do it. And I mean, we can get into any specifics around it of what we do. Um, but I think we're, we're kind of trying to use a blend of how do we get them to drop the amount of weight that they need to or that they essentially are going to demand as a pro athlete but do it in a way that's actually safe and is not going to put them at any risk and by the time they step in the ring or the cage for the actual fight that at that time point they should be fully rehydrated uh, or as best as they can possibly be uh, and feeling good excellent yeah because like you said eight percent should probably be the the limit of how much you drop because there's Mm. been some cases of people dropping 20% 20% body weight in mm. a couple of days and yes and dying from it. We had yeah, the, so, the MMA fighter I think it was last year. Yeah, in know uh, one FC I think it was uh one of their fighters um yeah so I think I mean that highlights to people just the dangers around it. Mm-hmm. Um and that, even beyond that we see like if you're dropping that much weight it's just going to be impossible to rehydrate and refuel in the time window you have. Mm-hmm. And so you're going to be underperforming anyway. So um, and, and people can only look at some good examples. Uh, I think if people follow the UFC, seeing Anthony Johnson, who used to cut the most insane amount of weight to try and make welterweight. So he was fighting at 170 pounds and he would look dead as he comes out for the weigh-in. Um, and then eventually he jumped two weight classes, starts competing at 205 pounds, and now he's one of the best fighters in the world. So I think um, people just need to realize that there is a point of where Getting down to lower weight class isn't always better, um, and some people can actually do do better by by going up a weight class, having a more sustainable or, or easy to navigate weight cut, and then just feeling really really good when when they're in in the ring or in the cage. Excellent. Now you mentioned a bit about, about uh, reducing carbohydrates in the last week. Do you also recommend manipulating sodium and and water as well during the last week? Yeah, so what we have uh, typically do is with the carbohydrates, that's pretty straightforward. And we'll, we'll probably start that carbohydrate reduction depending on 
the athlete's training schedule and when they program their kind of last few hard training sessions. Uh, we'll try and coincide it with that just to help with the glycogen depletion. Um, the same thing with the sodium and the water. So with the water intake, we'll typically do a, a loading strategy for probably about three to four days where they'll have a higher intake uh, of water. So for uh, a lot of our average guys, this could get, get up somewhere between seven, eight liters of water per day. And then we will restrict that dramatically on the day before the weigh-in. So a sudden drop um, to try and uh, lose more water weight. Um, this has been something that different kind of protocols have done over time. And we've never really had much research from it. Um, it's just basically been based more on mechanistic data of how we can try and affect things like aldosterone or antidiuretic hormone. And if we... Uh, the idea being that if we provide more uh, water all the time, we can get an uh, an upregulation and downregulation of, of providing more water and, and then taking it away of these different hormones, and therefore the water loss will be greater than if we didn't load with water and just restricted, say, the day beforehand. Uh, but there's been no real data up until very, very recently. So, and I don't think the the paper has actually been published yet, but just there's been some pre preliminary release of some of the results from. Um, uh, the Australian Institute of Sport have been looking at these very strategies that MMA fighters use to make weight. And they actually did a, a two groups. I think one was a the control where they just did the restriction the day before, an artificial weigh-in. And then the other group was doing a, wa a water loading strategy for three days before that restriction. And they actually did end up dropping, uh, losing more body water than the group that hadn't gone through the loading strategy. So we tend to put in uh, our numbers of how many liters of water um, and we do it on a, a basis of roughly about 100 mils per kilogram of body weight um, of a loading strategy for three to four days, um, typically three for most guys, uh, those numbers being in line with what they would have used in that study with the Australian Institute of Sport and then a, a dramatic reduction on the final day. Um, and that tends to drop a decent amount of water uh, doing that strategy. Um, but again, with the caveat, this is for a 24-hour uh, weigh-in. So if guys are doing a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu tournament uh, and they're weighing in uh, just before they step on the mat or doing uh, like an amateur boxing event where they're, again, doing same-day weigh-ins or something like any other kind of martial arts tournament where they're weighing in the same day, this is obviously not a strategy they want to do because – that level of dehydration is just too much. So um, that's that's typically how we've manipulated water for sure um, uh, with that. Excellent. And sodium, did you do something there as well? Yeah, so what we'll do is just a, a bit more kind of crude. We, we tend to just um, just cut sodium maybe a, a couple of days before that, that weigh-in, so just to try and change the sodium level. Um, I know anecdotally some guys will – the same idea will try and load sodium before they do that restriction because they're thinking the same way it'll work with water. Um, I haven't seen enough that to think that will have much of a, of a difference, but again, it's just something that hasn't been studied. So we'll generally just tell them to uh, cut out sodium or, or go on a low sodium diet for those last couple of days um, in conjunction with obviously doing the low residue, low fiber diet for those last couple of days as well to do that. Um, and one additional thing we sometimes will do as well is to change their, say so the day before the weigh-in, their meals will be maybe some liquid meals only, where they're getting all their fluid allowance for the day within those kind of maybe three shakes almost with just some uh, protein um, powder and um, so that they're essentially being able to have as little food residue in the tract and we're getting as much absorption of that stuff. Um, so again, just, just a way to try and keep uh, as... Uh, theoretically as little amount of actual residue within the gastrointestinal tract as we can um, and that tends to be uh, the main bulk of our strategies excellent all right danny uh, i think we'll uh, wrap it up there thank you so much for taking the time to do this uh, excellent podcast uh, before we sign off could you please tell us where people can find more information about you yeah, for sure. First off, thanks so much for having me on the, the show, Jim. You're doing a, a really great job and I appreciate you having me on so uh, with much. all the, the great guests you've had. So uh, the the work is really, really high quality. So so keep that up. Thank you. Um, for, for me, people can just go to sigmanutrition.com. It's easiest. They'll find all the information there. They get a link to check out uh, the podcast, uh, our coaching service, and then 
also the upcoming uh, Sigma weight cutting system, which is essentially going to be able to be a, be a blueprint of a lot of the stuff that I've talked about and the strategies we've used with these pro athletes for people to be able to take that information and to, to basically customize something for themselves and to work out, okay, what is a safer, more science-based protocol that they can use and a strategy over the course of their training camp and then their weight cut before a fight and their rehydration strategy. So laying out those, those essentially the methods we do and then some resources to be able to to plug in their own numbers and do that so um that's just up on the website as well if they just go to sigmanutrition.com there's just a tab that says weight cutting and they'll get more details about that and um yeah that's pretty much it everything will should be easily accessible on the site so if people just go there they should uh, find all the information they need perfect and uh, like i said guys you should uh, definitely check out uh, danny's uh, podcast if you're interested in, in anything related to training, nutrition, supplementation, and you also have some people there talking about uh, psychology sometimes and behavior as well. Mm. So uh, yeah. definitely check out uh, Danny's podcast. All right, Danny, thank you so much for your time and uh, I wish you a pleasant day. Thanks so much for having me, man. I really, really appreciate it. My pleasure. Okay, bye-bye. Goodbye. <laughs>